Fred is a 55-year-old male who comes in for a follow-up of his hypertension. Overall, he's doing well, but he complains that he's, quote, going all the time. He seems to spend more time looking for bathrooms when he's out and is now getting up a couple times a night to urinate. These symptoms have come on gradually, and he otherwise feels well. There's no family history of any GU cancers, and he's been watching TV where he's seen a variety of ads for all sorts of herbs, supplements, and medications to help treat his overactive bladder. Hi, this is Frank Domino, and joining me today to discuss overactive bladder in men is Robert Baldor, professor and chair of the Department of Family Medicine Bay State at the University of Massachusetts Medical School and assistant editor for the Five Minute Clinical Consult. Good morning, Bob. Morning, Frank. Good to be here again. So overactive bladder in men, this is something we, we both know about. Can you just remind us briefly a little bit about um, overactive bladder and in particular this research study that you're presenting, how it was defined? Yeah, I thought this was really an interesting study and as I've gotten a little older myself, a, a personal interest. So uh, they sort of defined overactive bladder here as uh, urgency and uh, multiple voids per day. And so the idea that you're going, 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 you have to go a lot is uh, as part of this and also getting up nocturia is part of that as well getting up at night to, uh, to urinate. But for their um, study here, they uh, defined it again as that sense of urgency and having to void nine or more times per day. That's, like, that's what got you into the study. They had men do a, uh, a diary, record a voiding diary, and it was a, a seven-day baseline diary to record these uh, episodes. Okay, so they, they found men who had no surgery, who had no other neurological complication, who voided nine or more times a day, um, what did this, how did this study roll out and what did it hope to prove? Yes, that's true. So a little bit of this is just to think, go back to the study. They, they excluded men who had obviously uh, had significant uh, problems with, uh, with the bladder. In fact, if you had a post-void residual volume of greater than 150 mLs, you were excluded. So really looking at pretty much healthy men with just your run-of-the-mill BPH symptomatology. And, uh, you know, we've been talking with women about Kegel exercises for years to help with incontinence. The question is, is can you use behavioral therapy to help men who have over active bladder symptoms. So what they did is they randomized these men into three um, different groups. Group one was uh, behavioral therapy. So the behavioral therapy piece of this was urge suppression strategies, delayed voiding, some sort of Kegel exercises, but also avoiding liquids for three hours before bed. The drug therapy group included starting out with a combination therapy. You're on an anti-muscarinic, uh, a sustained release uh, terolidine, and plus an alpha blocker, uh, Tamsleucin, uh, daily as part of that. They followed these men for uh, six weeks, and at six weeks times, uh, everybody was on combined therapy, uh, medication, and behavioral, uh, behavioral treatment uh, within that. All right, so uh, interesting kind of rollout. For six weeks, they all got one or a combination, and then by 12 weeks, they were all on everything. Um, what did they find? Yeah, so actually, uh, if you look at six weeks out, they actually found significant decreases in all three groups. But I thought this was fascinating. So the behavioral therapy group, a 25% reduction in their symptoms that wow. they were having just with the behavioral therapy. What does that mean? On average, 11.7 voids per day down to 8.8 .8 voids per day. So they're still going quite a bit here. The drug therapy group was actually less. The drug therapy group was a change of only 12.7%. Again, going from 11.8 .8 voids today down to 10.3 voids uh, today. And the combined therapy, which were medications and the behavioral therapy, had the best improvement. 30% reduction. Again, 11.8 down to 8.2 voids uh, per day. They followed them now for the full uh, 12 weeks. Now, 12 weeks out, and mind you, everybody's now on combined therapy, and basically they found uh, very uh, similar uh, results as they went along. About a 30% uh, reduction here over the course of, uh, of treatment, so that if you look at this, roughly everybody started around 12 voids per day. At the end, they were around 8 voids uh, per day. All right, um, so the authors had some, some conclusions, and I, I'd, be, I'd be wondering how they contrasted with your thoughts. Yeah, so it was really interesting that uh, I look at this, I see the behavioral therapy was, was effective, and uh, the authors noted that the combined behavioral and drug therapy yielded the greatest improvement in their symptoms than drug therapy alone, but not behavioral therapy alone. They concluded, though, that when you're using a stepped approach, 
start with behavioral therapy. Well, my conclusion on this is somewhat similar, except I don't see a huge benefit from taking two medications a day yeah. versus just continuing the behavioral therapy. So uh, my takeaway on this is spending some more time talking to men about the idea of doing Kegel exercises, no drinking three hours before bedtime. By the way, that's really hard for me to do. And avoiding those medications, which, you know, it adds expense, it adds a potential for side effects. I don't see a significant improvement over just the behavioral therapy. It's here. so interesting because my first my first line with men with BPH has always been to try a medication, and I think this study really says behavioral interventions are probably definitely the best bang for the buck and the most effective. So um, let's talk briefly. What are these exercises? What are, how do we instruct men to do this? Yeah. So I just want just to clarify. I don't want to say they're they're, they're the most effective. I think they're as effective. And, and and if you really look at the study, it does say the combination of all three is the most effective. Mm -hmm. But again, I think it's an incremental difference there, even though it's statistically significant. Uh, so what you're doing, you think about women, right? We talk about Kegel exercises for years. We've talked about the fact that you sort of tighten your pelvic muscles out uh, up as you're going. And, and if you're avoiding and you're trying to stop avoiding, you tighten those muscles up. Same issue with men. What you do is you tighten up those pelvic muscles, you do that slowly, tighten those muscles over about five seconds, slowly release it over five seconds, and repeat that uh, tightening and relaxing uh, strategy for about 10 cycles. Do that three times a day. You can also try while you're avoiding to see if you can stop voiding in the middle. Really hard for men to do that yes. though. But the other part is when you have to go, wait. Hold it as long as you can. Uh, don't rush off to the, you know, probably what happens is people are worrying about leaking or something, they're rushing off to the bathroom. But really work on this and over time it gets better. And then the final thing of course is avoiding the, any liquids three hours before bedtime. So it involves changing a little bit of the exercise that you do as well as what you do with dinner and thereafter. Yeah, I certainly started this myself, um, you know, and... Um, I've been doing it while we've been talking. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, interestingly enough. It's easy enough to do, and by the way, it's like those things where you're sitting in the car, you just kind of meditate. This could be part of your meditation practice as you're, as you're thinking about it as well. Easy to say, it's inexpensive, uh, there's no side effects from this, and it looks like there's significant benefit. Bob, thank you so much, this is great. Practice pointer, in men with overactive bladder symptoms, including urgency, frequency, and noctoria due to BPH, counsel them in behavioral treatments that include pelvic floor muscle training and fluid restriction before bedtime as an initial treatment. Join us next time when we discuss the prescribing cascade and how it can cause adverse effects to your patient.